Okay. Um, the presentation I'm about to give, the, uh, the handout, the PDF, is now available online on this site here, streaminglearningcenter.com. And it's the, uh, let's see if I can make this thing work here. With, yeah, there you go. So if you go to Streaming Learning Center, which is my blog, and then uh, encoding for iDevices should be up here on your top left. If you click that, you'll go to the main article, and that main article will have a link to the, um, to the handout. So you click over to the main article, and here's the PDF. There's a couple of slides that are different from what you're going to see, but there's nothing really materially different. OK, so here's our agenda for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, do we start at 10.30 or 10.45? 10.30, right? OK. Um, we're going to look at producing H.264 for iTunes. You know, there's two ways to deliver video to iDevices. There's cabled via iTunes, and then there's, you know, for, for connected devices, you know, either the iPhone, iPod Touch, or iPads, you can deliver it either via cellular or Wi-Fi. So there's two, two basic approaches to delivering to iDevices, and we're going to cover both of them. First, we'll, oops. First we'll start with uh, producing for iTunes, and then we'll look at how you get to video via either cellular or wireless. OK, so what is H.264? Um, H.264 is a spec that was jointly agreed upon by the ITU and the ISO. Um, lots of momentum in the consumer electronics space, com computer space, telephone, radio, photography, consumer electronics. Um, all that's very much amplified by Apple choosing H.264 for the video codec for their iDevices. So today when you produce video for, you know, for computer viewing, typically you approach, you know, I want a desktop solution, whether it's Flash or Silverlight, and then I need to get to iDevices. And the only way to get to iDevices is via H.264, and that's really all you need to know about H.264. Um, couple things you need to know about H.264 in order to produce effectively for iDevices. And it's not, a, it's not a deep dive into the H.264 parameters, but you do need to know what an H.264 profile is. And this is, um, this is a screen grab from Wikipedia, and we see the, the, three, the three main profiles that we produce for, if we're producing for computer playback, are baseline, main, and high. And so those are the profiles, and over here we see different encoding techniques that either apply or don't apply to those profiles, right? And as we, as we see from the definition on top, a profile defines a set of coding tools or algorithms that can be used to generate a bit stream. So we see, here are the encoding algorithms, and, and here are the profiles that use them. So we see that the high profile uses a lot more. And the assumption we would make from that is, A, we get a better quality video stream, and B, that video stream is probably harder to play back. Okay, so, so what the profile does is it lets Apple say, okay, I want to support H.264 in the original video capable iPod, but I don't want to spend a fortune on the CPU. So I'm only going to support the baseline profile. So that's what Apple says. And us as video producers, we say, well, if we want to get the video onto that device, we need to encode using the baseline profile. So profiles are a meeting point between the hardware developer, in this case Apple, and video producers like us. Okay? So the first thing you're going to need to know about any device that you're going to target is what profile can it play. And Apple's done a really, a really good job so if we go to iPad H.264 profile, and we go to the Apple specs, more than any other vendor that I've seen, Apple does a really good job saying, OK, this device can support video formats up to 1080p, 30 frames a second high profile level 4.1, okay? So Apple has done that for all their devices, and we're going to look at a summary of that in a moment. 
But if you wanted to produce for this device, you would go to this page, say, okay, well, this is the video that it can play, and then you have to make sure that your video fits within those parameters. Okay, first thing you need to know is the profile that's supported. And here are the, um, here are the target profiles that existed for all the devices. We're going to look at a more detailed presentation, but the high level is the original iPod Touch and iPhone through 4G was baseline. So all the older iPods were, were uh, through 4G were baseline profile. iPod, iPhone, 4G Plus, that should be main, excuse me. So this should be main over here. And then the iPad is main as well. Okay, and we're going to look at a chart that covers that in a second, and the chart's going to be right. So what are the issues you need to consider? Number one is if you want to produce a file that plays on all devices, you can use the baseline profile. What's the negative of that? You're going to have a file that doesn't look so great, and you're going to have a file that's pretty small resolution. Okay? So we're going to look at use cases for both iTunes delivery and for wireless or cellular delivery where you can use alternatives to that, and we'll cover that in a minute. And if you're producing for either the computer, you know, computer playback via flash or, or the iPad, then you'd want to use the main profile. Now I'm just, let me be honest with you here. Normally I try and resist that. Um, but I am just noticing that Apple has changed the specs for their iPad to the high profile level 4.1. So I, haven't, I looked at this when the iPad 2 came out and it was originally specced at the main profile, 720p. And even though I knew it could play files encoded with the high profile because I kind of tested that, uh, I'm noticing that the iPad now is spec'd up to high profile level 4.1 at 1080p. Okay, so let me point that out. The chart that you're going to look at in a, in a second is wrong. I'll get that corrected today and then I'll get that uploaded to the presentation. Okay, the second thing you need to consider when you're producing for Apple devices is the level. So again, we see here for the iPad, we see it supports high profile up to level 4.1. And what the level does is it constrains the resolution and the data rate of that particular file. So when you're producing for any of these iDevices, you're going to need to check the profile and the level. And that is, and that's what I do here. So this chart, which I created when the original iPad 2 came out, um, the original specs, as I said, were main profile to level 3.1. But this kind of summarizes the specifications of all the iDevices that you're going to be targeting. So the original iPod, the original video capable iPod, could only accept video 32240, 768 kilobits per second maximum, baseline profile to level 3.1. So if you're producing for this device here, or these devices here, those are the parameters that you would have to use. Now, when the iPod Nano and Classic came out, they were able to take video up to 640 by 480 resolution, again, baseline profile, but level 3.0, at a maximum data rate of 2.5 megabits per second. And that were, those were the same parameters for the iPod Touch and the iPhone here. And then starting with the iPhone 4 and the iPod Touch 4, the video that they were capable of playing was main profile to level 3.1, 720p resolution. And then the, the original iPad 1 were these specs, and as we just noticed, Apple changed the specs for the iPad 2 to high profile level 4.1, uh, capable of playing video up to 1080p. So what I'm going to do when I get back to my room is to, is to make another column here that kind of incorporates the new specs that Apple updated. Either way, you kind of get the point. When you're, when you're creating video for these devices, you have a decision to make, particularly for iTunes. And you're going to have to say, okay, which devices do I want to support? And you know, am I going to produce video files for those devices? So what I wanted to do was try and figure out what most producers were doing for iTunes delivery. So what I did is I, 
I downloaded about 48 files from 34 different producers, um, three letter networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, um, prominent technology sites like CNET and This Week in Tech, and downloaded their featured podcast. And these are all free downloads. So these are ones I just wanted to see what people who were producing podcasts for free downloads were doing. And the questions I wanted to ask were, should you abandon 320 by 240? Should you abandon this group here? So I wanted to take a look at, well, how many producers like CNN or the White House or CNET were actually still producing for 320 by 240? And what I found was that nine of the 48 files that I downloaded were 320 by 240 or lower, which meant that of the 34 producers, nine were still producing video files that could still address the oldest video capable iPod. Okay, so if you want to address the widest possible audience, you, you would consider doing that as well. In that group were some, most of the three letter networks were still doing that. CNN did that, ABC did that, CBS did that. The, uh, the Barack Obama White House, they had a podcast, they did that as well. Oprah did that. So if you really want the broadest possible reach, you're going to still produce the 320 by 240 podcast for those targets. You can also produce at 640 by 480 with the MPEG-4 codec, which is a, a lower quality, uh, easier to decode codec. That's an alternative for the, three the, uh, the oldest iPods, and one of, the, one of the companies was doing that. So 10 out of 34, or about 30%, still addressed the lowest, uh, the oldest and the lowest quality devices. So again, if, you, if you're producing podcasts and you want a, the broadest possible reach, that's what you'd want to go after. And looking at it the other way, if you wanted to produce at 720p or higher, um, how, many, how many of the producers who produced at 720p or higher also produced a smaller stream that would play on the older you know, iPhones and iPods? And, and, and what I found was that 11 of 12 producing at 720p also produced at 640 by 480 or lower. So if you're going to go after the iPads, you're going to go after the iPhone 4 and the iPod Touch 4s with 720p videos, you're probably also going to want to produce a lower quality stream that addresses you know, the, big, the big group in here. So 30% address these, these users here. Almost 100% of people who produced over here also produced a file that served these devices here. And then should you produce multiple files? And a lot of producers were producing the same show in different sizes. So if you wanted to produce at 320 by 240 to get the broadest possible audience, you might also consider producing at 720p so the video looks great on an iPad. And 18 of the 34 producers, which is a little bit over 50%, we're producing in a single size only. The typical single size that they produced at was the 640, 480, 640, 360 resolution. So they targeted the middle, and those would play very well on the middle devices, but also look pretty good on the iPads and the iPhone 4 and iPod Touch 4. So the first, you know, this survey that I first talked about was all free podcasts available on iTunes. Then I wanted to look at well, what are the people who are producing paid content? What were they doing with the videos that they produced? So the mu music videos that I downloaded were all SD. So you know, I looked at the most popular music that was available for download, and what I saw is most were 640 by 480 or smaller, so they don't play on the oldest iPods, but they play on pretty much everything since those were produced. And they all use 256 kilobits per second audio. So if you're producing a, a music video, these are the specs that I would use. And this is, this is one of the few groups I've ever seen that actually use 256 kilobits per second audio. Most producers you know, stop at like 160. The, the vast majority use 128 kilobits per second. Okay, so what about high definition television episodes? What I found was that everybody was at 720p. And again, the data rate, we're going to look at the data rate of the free downloads in a minute, but the average data rate here was around, you know, a little bit above 4.1 megabits per second for 720p. 
In contrast, YouTube encodes their 720p videos at two megabits per second. You know, and that's for general distribution over the internet. So if you're producing HD TV episodes, 720p is the resolution that most people are producing at, a little bit over four megabits per second, and around 160 kilobits per second for audio. And what I found interesting is that anytime I downloaded an HD episode, and this, these are paid HD episodes, I also got an SD episode. It was almost like the producers were saying, well, this person may not have an iPod or an iDevice that's capable of playing this, so let me send an SD version so it will load on their iDevice, um, and then they won't have a bad experience. And these are the parameters that I saw of the SD files that were transferred automatically when I downloaded the HD files. So 640 by 480, um, 23 frame or 24 frames per second, that's the TV production, kind of the film production rate, and the audio was around 128 kilobits per second on average. So going back to the free podcasts that I downloaded, what were the parameters that were most typically used to produce those files? What this chart does is these are the encoding parameters for the 320 by 240 preset in Apple Compressor. So I wanted to look at what is Apple Compressor doing, and then I wanted to look at the data rates actually used by producers for the files that I downloaded. So if you're not using Compressor, you should go to the encoding tool that you're using and make sure that the parameters in here are close to what we're seeing here because that's what, that's what people are actually doing. And what I found was Apple Compressor was the target data rate of 600 kilobits per second, maximum data rate of 768. And why a maximum of 768? Because that's the maximum those devices can play. And the average data rate that I saw in this class was 520 kilobits per second. So if you're producing a 320 by 240 file or a 32180 file, I would target around 520, 550 kilobits per second and 128 kilobits per second audio. And 64480, 64360, in the Apple compressor preset, the target was 1.5 megabits per second, the average target with a maximum data rate of 2.5 megabits per second, and the producers in this target resolution that I saw produced at 1.3 megabits per second. So again, we're seeing a pretty good, pretty good consistency between the 1.3 that they actually targeted and the 1.5 that the that, uh, that compressor used. Compressor said 128 kilobits per second. What I saw was 114 kilobits per second. So again, that was close. And where I saw a pretty big disparity was in the 720p parameters. So what Apple produced with their 720p parameters was 10 megabits per second average data rate, 14 megabits per second maximum. And what I saw in the, in the free podcast that I downloaded that this resolution was a target of around 2.8 megabits per second. So if I was producing with compressor, what I would do is change my preset from 10 target 14 maximum to, to a target of three with maybe a maximum of, of four or four and a half. You don't need 10 megabits per second to make 720p video look good with the H.264 codec. How do we know that? Because the HD TV episodes that I paid three bucks for each, this is from Hollywood, were encoded at four megabits per second. So that's kind of a I don't have anything that I need to produce at higher quality than what Hollywood does. So I would use a maximum of four megabits per second if I was producing 720p for podcast delivery. Okay, so that's the tethered side. You know, if you're, if you're producing for iTunes, that's all that. Now we're going to look at, okay, we want to get, we want to get video to devices that are connected, either iPhones, iPads, iPod touches that are connected via wireless or connected via cellular. And it's a totally different, totally different paradigm, totally different 
mechanism for doing that. Now, there's, there's two ways to do it, and the best way to do it is via HTTP live streaming. And HTTP live streaming is an adaptive streaming specification that Apple produced for getting video to connected devices. It's since then been adopted by Android for Android 3.0 devices and higher. So this is adaptive streaming. Adaptive streaming is multiple file delivery that adapts to changing conditions um, at the player end. So that is the preferred way to get video to iDevices. You can also send a single file, but if you, if you send only a single file, typically you're going to have a poor experience on the higher quality devices and, and an acceptable experience on the lower quality devices. You're not going to send a 4 megabit per second 720p file if that's the only file that you, that you use because it's not going to get to a bunch of the devices and it won't play on a bunch of the devices. We'll, we'll cover that more in a second. So the concept of adaptive streaming is you want, you want, you want to create multiple files and you want high power, high bandwidth devices to get a good experience and you want low power, low bandwidth devices to get a lesser experience, but it's still going to play. You want it to adapt to changing conditions. You know, so if I'm, if I'm using my iPhone to watch some video in my house connected via Wi-Fi and then I leave in the car and I switch over to cellular, I want it to adapt to the different bit rates and I want it to do it transparently. I don't want to have to click a different button because I'm connecting via cellular as compared to Wi-Fi. What do we like about adaptive streaming? It's the best possible experience. You know, if you've got a high quality stream, um, you know, if you've got iPads there that can, that can now play up to 1080p video, if you're streaming to them adaptively, you can supply 1080p videos to the iPad 2 as well as 32240 video to the original iPhone. And, and you couldn't do that if you were streaming adaptively because you'd have to pick a stream that was the lowest common denominator stream. So there's two issues when you're producing for adaptive streaming. One is, you know, how many streams, what resolutions, what data rates? You know, what are the configurations of these multiple streams that I'm producing? And the second one is, how do I work within the requirements of the adaptive streaming technology? What do I do differently when I'm producing multiple streams as compared to a single stream? And we'll cover that, we'll cover those separately. Let me talk a little bit about how HTTP live streaming works. And when you produce for HTTP live streaming, you encode a file in H.264 format. That's the only file that, that's the only format that you can use with HTTP live streaming. And then you produce it, you, you, you have one long file, or actually several long files, and then you send that into a stream segmenter that divides it up into chunks of files all encoded using the MPEG-2 transport stream, and you also create metadata files that kind of tell everywhere where to go to get those additional files. And let me show you what I mean. So if you were producing three streams, low, medium, and high, these are the chunk files. These are the transport stream files that you have for each variation. So these, of course, are the three streams you're producing. This is the general index file here. These are the index files for the individual streams. Now, HTTP live streaming doesn't require a streaming server. This is a totally player-driven technology. So what the player does, the player might download this, this bit here, low, zero, one, the first chunk of the lowest possible quality stream. And it goes to this file here, and it says, you know, give me the lowest, lowest quality chunk. So it goes to this one and gets low01.ts, and this, of course, contains the URL for all these chunks. When the player says, okay, I'm playing this fine, bandwidth will support a higher quality stream, the player checks this index file, and this index file sends them to this index file, and then it downloads this chunk here. So the player is making all these decisions. The player is in charge of going out, understanding where the alternative chunks are and retrieving them. You don't need a server you know, you need a server to contain the data, but you don't need a streaming server to deliver the data. And that's the primary difference of this technology as compared to RTMP-driven Flash. With Flash, you have a, 
a state, stateful connection between the server and the player at all times. And the server is in charge of changing streams. With HTTP Live Streaming, you create these chunks, you create the index file, and the player is in charge of going and getting the streams it needs to continue playing. Now, if you're producing for HLS, the place where you want to start for getting your information is the Apple tech note on the subject. And you can find it at this URL here. Of course, if you download the, the PDF, you can have that um, within the PDF. So this is what Apple tells you to do if you're producing 16 by 9 content for HTTP live streaming. And they're pretty detailed about it. It's a nice a nice presentation. So you've got the dimensions that they recommend that you use. You've got the bit rate that they recommend that you use. Um, Keyframe interval here. And then the baseline and level here. So if I was starting production for HTTP live streaming, the first thing I would do would be to go download this best practices. And those would be the resolutions and data rates that I would start with. A couple things I want to point out because we're going to talk about them in a minute. Um, Note that they use the baseline profile here, 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 and then switch to the main profile here. So this allows them to produce files that play on the oldest connected devices in this range. And then here, they're producing devices that are, in, they're producing streams that are incompatible with the oldest devices. So the index file structure is smart enough that if this was a, if this was a main profile stream, that the original iPhone wouldn't play, this contains information that tells that iPhone, look, don't retrieve any of these streams. They're incompatible with you. OK? So it's kind of a self-policing mechanism. And that gives you the ability to use, you know, to produce video streams that won't play on the older devices because the older devices aren't going to try and download and play the, device, the, uh, the stream. A couple other things that, are, you know, that I find noteworthy. Um, Apple is using the same audio data rate for all of these files. So here, the video data rate is 110. Here, it's 150. So it's obviously a 40 kilobit per second difference. Here, it's 4,500 kilobits per second bit rate. Here, it's 4,540. So Apple is recommending you use the same audio parameters for all the files that you produce in an adaptive streaming set of files. Not all producers do that, but that's clearly what Apple is recommending. Apple's also, what's unstated here, but if you, if you read the, the tech note, you'll see, is the keyframe interval. Here we're saying a keyframe interval of 30. Here it's 45. Here it's 90. The, the keyframe interval in terms of frames is changing, but this file is produced at 10 frames per second. This file is produced at 15 frames per second. So they're using a keyframe interval of three seconds for all files. So that's very critical when you're producing for adaptive streaming because the chunked, the chunked data files here all need to start on a keyframe. And they need to be the same keyframe. So this, this file here needs to start on the same keyframe as this file here, right? Because otherwise, you'd have, a you'd have a, an interrupt, a dis you know, some kind of um, discontinuation from, from chunk one in one stream to chunk two in another stream. So you need a consistent keyframe interval of all your, in all your encoded files. And Apple does that again because this file is encoded at 10 frames per second, this at 15, and all these at 30. OK, so now we know the stream count, the resolution, and the data rate. How do we customize the encoding? for adaptive streaming. What do we do differently because we're producing for adaptive streaming? And as I just mentioned, you know, the first thing is to make sure that the, the keyframe interval divides evenly into the chunk size and that the keyframe location is identical in all streams. And let me show you. Let me show you how this is implemented in Sorensen Squeeze, which is, a, which is a nice, one of the nicer presentations of producing for adaptive streaming. So this is their Apple HLS preset. And these are the parameters for the streams that they recommend. 
These do not match the Apple parameters. Probably the first thing I would do would be to change the resolutions and the data rates to match what Apple's doing. What we're seeing, what we see is they want a keyframe interval in all these streams. So they have one, two, three, four, five, six streams. They want a keyframe interval every three seconds in all streams, and they want to start a new chunk every nine seconds. So we talked about the chunks that these files are being produced into, and the keyframe interval has to divide evenly into the fragment duration or the chunk size, because if it doesn't, you won't have a keyframe starting each chunk, right? So looking at, so if we look at, these are the various chunks that contain video data. We all know that you can't start playing back a video file except at a keyframe, right? Because the keyframe has all the video data, iframes and p-frames, or b-frames and p-frames will not. So there has to be a keyframe here, a keyframe here, a keyframe here, and a keyframe here, so that you can start playing the chunk file as soon as it's received. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the keyframe interval divides evenly into the chunk size, which is, which is what you see here in the Sorensen squeeze preset. So it's a keyframe every three seconds, in a nine second fragment duration. Okay, so rule number one, keyframe interval must divide evenly into the chunk duration and keyframe location must be identical in all streams. So use the same keyframe interval and most, I would recommend disabling scene change detection because you, you want regular keyframes, you want to keyframe at every, the beginning of every chunk, otherwise it's not gonna work. Issue number two is CBR versus VBR. You know, variable bitrate encoding uses different data rates that, that adjust according to scene complexity. If you have a hard to compress scene, the data rate goes up. If you have a talking head, the data rate goes down. We like that because that delivers the overall best quality. Um, what we don't like about VBR is that it creates a stream that varies, which could cause too much stream switching. You know, in an ideal adaptive streaming scenario, you'd want to get to the perfect stream for that connection and just stay there. But if you have huge variations in chunk size that relate to the fact that you're using VBR, then you could cause scene, scene or a stream switching that, that doesn't reflect changing conditions. So here's, here's the downside of CBR. This is a project I did for a, a UK client, and this is a CBR stream so we see a, a relatively consistent data rate, but right after a major scene change, a camera switch from you know, a camera looking down at the artwork to the, the camera facing the, um, the artist, we see very, very low quality here because CBR can't really produce the data to comprehend the change at high quality. And this is the VBR stream. We see much more variability in the stream and we see very, very good quality immediately after the transition in, the, uh, in the, uh, the camera change. So we like CBR because it gives us a nice consistent stream, but we don't like the negative quality that it can produce. And then if you, if you look at VBR, which is the alternative, so here we have a file encoded with VBR, variable bitrate encoding. So all of the chunks aren't of equal size. This chunk you know, average video to encode. This would be a hard to encode scene. The chunk's bigger because that's what VBR does. VBR applies more data to a chunk that's hard to compress. And this chunk is very easy, so it's smaller. So when you start sending this chunk here, the delivery takes longer because it's a bigger chunk. And then the player that's checking the buffer says, oh my goodness, the buffer's too low. I have to switch to a lower bit rate. So it generates a stream switch that doesn't reflect changing conditions it just reflects the fact that you use VBR to encode your video. So you don't want to have that happen because too many stream switching, uh, switching degrades the experience. So what's the answer? You know, the, the most conservative thing to do is to use CBR. You know, that will give you, you know, all chunk sizes will be pretty much even and you won't have any stream switching that relates to the technique you use to encode your videos as compared to uh, changing conditions. What I see a lot of real-world producers do 
is use what's called constrained VBR. So in the context of squeeze, what their template does is it uses one pass CBR, okay, constant bit rate encoding. But you can also use two pass VBR and then constrain the data rate to a maximum. So what that does is it makes sure the swings aren't too high. The swings would be within, you know, the maximum data would be 160% of the target as compared to, say, 400% of the target. Um, so if I'm, use, if I'm producing for adaptive streaming, typically what I do is I recommend that we use constrained VBR, and I constrain the data rate usually to around 150% of the target. Um, I will say I, I did an article in streaming media. Um, I can give you the reference after the class, or we can we can find it online. If you if you Google, um, let me just do it real quick. Okay, so this is on my site, and uh, I'll find this is this is a a recent article that I wrote. Let me see if I can. Okay, what I did for the article and what's reflected in in a book that you'll see the the um, the information for in a moment is I spoke to a bunch of producers and I asked them what they were doing. A lot of the producers produce it at one pass CBR because that is the most conservative option. However, some producers like MTV produced it two pass VBR. So I'm not gonna tell you don't produce it VBR because a lot of producers are doing that. I'm just saying if you produce it VBR, number one, constrain it, and number two, make sure in your test that you're not introducing too many stream searches that relate to the technique that you use to produce the video as opposed to changing conditions. Okay, so that's VBR versus CBR. In general, for audio parameters, what we see is, you know, Adobe will tell you with their adaptive streaming um, white papers, don't, don't change the audio parameters of the file. And what we see Apple recommending with their, with their templates is don't change the audio, right? We saw 40 kilobits per second audio throughout the entire spectrum of, of files that they produce. So the most conservative option is to keep the same audio parameters for all files. And, and again, if, that's, you know, if you're just starting out, that's probably what I would recommend. But again, speaking to the producers that I spoke with for that article, um, some people do switch to higher quality streams for the higher quality files. And what I would recommend doing is, you know, if I wanted to switch, I would keep the same sampling rate, and I'd shift from 64 kilobits per second mono to 128 kilobits per second kilobits per second stereo, and I would test to make sure that when I switched streams, there wasn't any audible popping. Okay, the most conservative is keep the same audio parameters. Real world producers aren't doing that. If you decide to change, make sure you test to make sure you're not introducing artifacts. What else do I do? You know, as Apple suggests, make sure that you adapt the profile to the target stream. You know, the easiest way to do that is to just, you know, use the, the, uh, the suggestions that Apple makes in their tech note. This is something I found out in the last day or so. Um, I, there's a couple of people here already producing for, for iDevices. I'd be interested if they're, if they're using B-frames. This is an, actually a, a Microsoft web page. This is, you know, they're talking about their ability to transmux Silverlight streams and distribute them to iDevices. And in their configuration recommendations, they're saying don't use B-frames when targeting iPhone and iPod devices. Because some, they said Apple recommends that you not use B-frames. I couldn't find where Apple recommended that. Um, but that's something I, was, I just got aware of yesterday. And then I also heard yesterday of some time stamping issues with some encoding tools where B-frames are delivered out of order. So Sometimes that confuses 
you know, when you got frames out of order in the different chunks, sometimes that confused some players with some encoding tools. So that's something I would also watch out for. If I'm being very conservative, I probably would avoid B frames in the first generation iteration and then test with B frames later on because B frames do deliver additional quality. Okay, what do you do if you're producing, you, know, you want to produce for iDevices, but you also want to produce for Flash or Silverlight? How do you do that? In the past, that meant two separate workflows. So you need one encoding set for iDevices, one encoding set for Silverlight or for Flash. And what we're seeing now are multiple options to transmux the H.264 stream. And when I say transmux, this is different than re-encoding, right? So if you produce five H.264 streams for Flash, you're, you're encoding those with the H.264 codec, and what and what technologies like Wowza Media Server can do, and now Microsoft and Adobe and Real Networks, is they can take this stream of H.264 data and then in real time convert that into MPEG-2 transport stream chunks, create the necessary metadata, and upload those to a web server for delivery to iDevices. So again, two years ago, if you wanted to support both Flash and iDevices, you needed two encoding tools. Now you can use one encoding tool and then transmux for delivery to multiple formats. Okay? And Wowza Media Server was the first to do it, and they can accept RTMP, RTSP, and MPEG-2 transport stream input. Again, all encoded with the H.264 codec, because that's what you have to deliver to the, you know, to iDevices. But then it can do the chunking and the metadata creation in real time and then create the, the experience necessary to support iDevices. Wowza was the first one to do that. Microsoft IIS can do that with a Silverlight stream from Expression Encoder. So if you're producing with Expression Encoder, sending that to IIS, the Microsoft server can transmux that for delivery to iDevices. And what Adobe Flash Media Server 4.5 can do is they can take an RTMP stream and then do the same thing. They can chunk the data up, they can create the metadata files, and then support the iDevice experience. And then Real Networks, their Helix server should also be listed up here. Akamai can do this. Akamai is a content delivery network, and they can do this within their server system. So Turner is a company that I talk with a lot. You know, I write about, the, I write about some of the things that they do. Two years ago, they had separate encoding facilities for iDevice and for Flash. And what they did last year, and, and what they did last year was they sent an RTMP stream to Akamai, and then Akamai did what they called in-the-network repackaging, where they were able to take the data, convert it into MPEG-2 transport stream chunks, create the metadata file, and then present that as HLS compatible data. So long story short, if you want to support both iDevices and another computer protocol, whether it's Flash or Silverlight, you don't have to, you can do it via transmuxing as compared to, you know, two separate encoding facilities and two separate production capabilities. So if you're producing for adaptive streaming, these are the sources I would check. Um, there's nice convenient fitly references here. And then if you're, if you're not doing adaptive, this is where you have to choose a lowest common, common denominator file. This is where you're not going to make anybody happy. Because if you've got people you know, on a Wi-Fi connection with their iPad, they're not going to like the 640 by 360 stream or the 400 by 224 stream. So if you're producing for iDevices, HTTP live streaming is the way to go. And if you're doing static file delivery, you just need to pick one of these configurations that, that, you know, and then put that up on your website. Well, your only alternative is to pick a, a lowest common, denomin common denominator website that's, you know, that's going to play on most devices but won't look good on the high performance, high quality devices. Okay, any questions? Yeah, two questions. Oh, not you. You're
why the um, so why longer chunk sizes for Apple? And Apple did rec it was kind of funny because they recommended a keyframe interval of three and then a chunk size of ten, so it didn't even divide evenly. So, I mean, I'm forgetting when I read. I think they explained that, but I don't I don't think a lot of people are doing that. I think a lot of people are going to the shorter chunks. Um, I think they said that produced the best experience, blah blah blah, but. Um, most of the producers that I'm seeing are in the, the, the five and six second range, if not, if not shorter. One of the things some producers, so if you look at the Sorensen presets in detail, you'll see that they divide them between long form and short form production. So if you're doing a 30 second commercial or a minute and a half video, you want a shorter keyframe duration and a shorter chunk interval, so you get a more responsive, you know, you get faster stream switching and you get to the ideal, um, the ideal transfer rate, the ideal stream quicker. If you're producing a 90-minute movie, that many keyframes can really start to degrade quality. So you want to use a longer keyframe interval and a longer chunk size. So I think you'll see a lot of people doing that. Was there any way to get the uh, inversion? Is there any way to choose the bit rate that you start out with the i player? I don't know. Jan, do you know? Okay, so Jan, Jan's a producer for Deutsche Welle, and um, if Pete says there's no way to do it or he doesn't know, then. Yeah, okay, so the heuristics of the iOS player is they don't, typically, if you look at Silverlight and Flash, they monitor both CPU utilization and buffer. And iOS devices only monitor the buffer. They don't look at CPU. So that, pardon? No, I think Flash looks at CPU as well. I, I could be, I could be wrong in that, but that's my, that's my impression. Any other questions? Good, good question. Is there any iDevice? Simulation player, not that I've seen. Does anybody know of one? That would be con very convenient, wouldn't it? Can I use uh, uh, RC high efficiency? Say it again. Um, you know, why don't we go back to, so what level of audio can you use? Why don't we go back to, so here's, so what you're seeing is um, AC, LC audio, and that's for the highest power devices. So I would say stick to AC, LC for all. And let me, let me just check the chart here because I, I think I had that right. Yeah, so the research that I did was AACLC as well, only. Any other questions? Okay, I meant to say there should have been a slide. This is, this is a book that I wrote that covers a lot of these materials. There's a chapter on pretty much what we just covered or a couple of chapters. It's a $30 book and I'm selling here at the show for uh, 10 pounds or 10 euros. So if anybody wants one, I've got a few. Just come up and, and, uh, and, and pick it up. If there's no other questions, then, uh, then let's conclude. Thank you very much.